donations. And so if you would like to make a contribution in that effort, please see Sister Lisa Williams for additional details. Uh, youth Day and Graduate Reception is next Sunday. This will be embedded in the morning worship service. We want to recognize the efforts of our youth and the growth that they have made this past year. And at this time, I'm going to get one more announcement um, before we do that. Um, fri on Friday, May the 19th at 6 p.m., we had a quarterly church business meeting. Uh, that was announced, and so we were very happy to see those who were able to attend to do so. If you are not able to attend the business meeting, we want you to understand that that's designed for full congressional co participation, and it's utilized to update members on the activities of the church and conducting the vital business of the church. In Friday's meeting, there were some changes made to address the ongoing financial needs of the church, and these changes regarding the budget and various financial protocols. All changes were made through prayerful consideration, thoughtful consideration, and based on the efforts and guidance of multiple individuals and committees. If you were unable to attend and would like specific information from that meeting, please contact the church business office. At this time, I want to make a special welcome to someone who's visiting us, not for the first time, he's been here before, but we want to recognize him for his efforts, his ongoing efforts in this community and other places. With us this morning is Dr. Robert Bubb. He is a professor of research and statistics at Auburn University. Dr. Bubb has ties to this community and to Mount Rose through his maternal great-great-grandmother. He has been instrumental in not only researching his family history, but is teaching others to research their family histories and to acknowledge the accomplishments and the involvement of African-American individuals and families. He and his family are actively involved in the restoration project for our own Camp Town Cemetery. We welcome you, Dr. Bubb. We're glad that you're worshiping with us today, and we're going to ask you to come up now and have a few words. Good morning, Mount Rose family. I am blessed to be here today. Uh, blessed uh, to be here in this building, be in the house of the Lord. Blessed to be in the church congregation where my great grandmother, my great great grandmother, and my great great grandmother worshiped. Uh, I'm also blessed to be here uh, to witness the, the baptisms, baptisms that we just saw. Right? It's a blessing to see the kingdom of God grow, is it not? So um, uh, this is not my first time here. I was here about a year ago in June. Uh, you may not recognize me. I had a beard then. I have since shaven it. Uh, so I look a little bit different uh, to, uh, today. Um, but I thought I'd come up here just uh, with a few minutes and just uh, tell maybe a story or two and then talk about my two-time great-grandmother. Uh, and so if you look on the monitor there, uh, in, in this monitor, um, and I think you can, you can see her right there in front of the doors. But there's my great-grandmother, um, Lillian. Uh, this was uh, somewhere between 1909 and 1912. And this picture is Mount Rose Missionary Baptist Church uh, when they were living across the street from the, the church itself. Uh, and then the other picture is my great-grandmother, Lillian. Um, uh, and I'd just like to tell maybe a, a story about her really quick. And then I think that'll lead into my, my great-grand, my great-great-grandmother. So um, uh, my great-grandmother, Lillian, uh, the, the picture that you saw up there, uh, she passed away, I think, when I was 12, right? And I always remember going to her house because we always went during the summer. We'd go up, because I was in California, we'd go up into the hills, up into Quincy, where she lived, and I dreaded the trip. Dreaded it every single year because I knew when we went up there that I'd have to sleep in the attic. And there's nothing scarier for a young child to be sleeping up in the attic. She had a small stone house and had two bedrooms, one bedroom for her, another guest bedroom where my parents slept, and then me and my sister had to go up to the attic to sleep. And it's scary, it was scary. Um, but my, uh, my, my great grandmother, Lillian, she was the last person in my family to identify as black. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? Um, so uh, where she grew up, she was part of the only black family in the community. And as you can 
can imagine um, the racism, discrimination that she received. And the children were quite cruel to her as she was growing up. And so she made a decision. She decided that when she had her children, she would raise them to be white so that they had every opportunity that a white child would have. Um, and I know, and I, and I know there's a sentiment out there, and I understand it, especially now I understand it, um, that you know, she sold her birthright for a pot of porridge. But I also understand a mother's love for her children, right? Is that they may have opportunities that otherwise um, would not have. But because of her choice, it meant that that history, right? Her mother, her grandmother, that their stories would not be told, right? Because if you're gonna make that decision, you have to change everything, right? And so my grandfather never knew his grandmother. She died before he was born. He only knew a few things about her. He knew that she was a poor, uneducated black woman from Louisiana. And what he knew couldn't be any further from the truth, right? She wasn't poor, right? She was born enslaved, right? Um, she was, didn't have a formal education, but she was brilliant. Um, and she wasn't from Louisiana, she was from Texas, right? Her name was Louisiana. And so that got kind of confused in there. So um, I'd like to just take a, a quick moment just to talk about my great-great-grandmother, Louisa Mangrum. And you might recognize that name, because that name is the street. It is right over here, I think, on this side. Yeah, on this side, uh, right next to the church. So Louisa, she was born enslaved. Uh, her mother, my three times great-grandmother, name was Caroline. Um, her um, father, I suppose we could say father, was their enslaver. Right? He sold my great-great-grandmother when she was 11 or 12 years old from my three times great-grandmother, Caroline. Um, Louisa was emancipated at about the age of 17. And by the age of 19, she bought her first piece of property right across the street over on that side, right, between Mangrum and Garrett Street. A couple years later, she bought another piece of property. Right? And then she started managing property. And before you knew it, she had six lots between Mangrum and Garrett. She owned two and three quarters acres where Pickard High uh, used to be. Right? And she actually sold that property in 1880 for the building of a school for black children. She owned property on the east side of the cemetery. She owned 12 acres out there. She owned a house on Sandy, which I think is Alamo now. She owned 100 acres east of Brenham, another 100 acres northeast of Brenham, and a third 100 acres northwest of Brenham. In 1890, she decided that she would expand, and she moved to California, where she purchased a 13-room boarding house in Oakland, California right, in downtown, and then she got another 160 acres up in the hills um, near Fair Play. And she would travel back and forth between Oakland and Brenham every couple years to manage all of her properties. She was married to two men at the same time, a freedman here in Brenham, Smith Mangrum, and in California um, uh, to a German Im immigrant named Fred Hughes. You can probably guess who my, uh, my two-time great-grandfather is. German immigrant in California. She was an amazing lady, and I could talk probably a couple hours about her life. It's fairly well documented. Um, she accomplished a lot in the time that she had. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to manage two households two, across two states without the other one knowing about the other one, you know? That'd be, that'd be kind of tough, so. But I just wanted to tell you just a little bit about her. Um, I just wanted, I think she wants me to tell her story, right? I, I need to say that. I, mean, I want to tell you, but I think she wants me uh, to tell you as well. Um, so, uh, you know, when you see Mangrum Street sign, uh, that is named after her. Um, she chose Texas and California purposely, though, because um, at that time, women could not hold property solely in their name away from their hu husband, except for those two states. So she's very strategic in what she did. She's going to make sure what is mine stays mine. Um, which I think is, is commendable. Uh, I just want to share a quick uh, scripture with you, and, and um, uh, it's in Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 22, uh, 31. And it's Christ. It's Jesus. He's responding to the Sadducees who are asking about uh, the resurrection, who didn't believe in the resurrection. And he told them that they erred greatly. Right? 
And he goes on in verse 31, and he says, Have you not read that God said to you, um, For I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so I'm here to tell you that your ancestors are very much alive. They are alive in Christ. Not only are they alive in Christ, but they are alive in your memories. They're alive in the stories that we tell. And as long as we're sharing those stories and we're telling those stories, they live on. Um, the other thing is that they're alive in the very DNA that is in you. Right? We are made up of our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. Their DNA um, is, is in us. There's research that shows that the environment encodes on your DNA. It changes your DNA. So when you walk around, you are carrying your ancestors with you. You are carrying their experiences, everything they've gone through, all their successes, all their trials. You carry that, uh, that with you. So that means the more you know about you, the more you know about your ancestors, right? the more that will guide you in your life because you'll know more about yourself. Um, I've probably taken enough time here, so I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. Um, but uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, back. Uh, I think the next time I'll be out down here will be in July. I'm going to do my best to come every couple months. Um, uh, I'm from Auburn, Alabama, so it's, it's a bit of a drive. Um, but there's lots of work for me to do here, and I want to be a service as best that I can. And so thank you again for all your welcoming attitude. I've always felt welcome here. Uh, I do consider this as part of my family, not only because of the ties, but because of what you bring to it as well. And so thank you.